start our illustrious speaker is uh, Professor Chivan. Chivan graduated from Charles de Gaulle, but now uh, joined Cardiff University as a full-time member of staff in 2001, and he was appointed professor there of law in 2006. And he has many other accomplishments and affiliations. And he has uh, written a lot, uh, uh, published extensively on uh, sociology of law, legal philosophy, constitutional law, and comparative laws, and theory of uh, human rights. So, please be careful. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. And, uh, and then the title is Socialist Legality and Politics of the Center. Yeah, and uh, I feel very privileged to have been invited here and uh, it's great to see so many friends and uh, I only uh, uh, regret that uh, the time is so short and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that uh, an event like this uh, could be organized by the Vasavala Library. And uh, uh, I was even more astonished to realize that I'm supposed to speak so early in the conference because uh, usually lawyers uh, spoil the whole event. You know? <laughs> but, um, um, my friend Václav uh, Bělohradský was quoted here in, in, from his email, but uh, some time ago we were at a conference together. He was speaking before lunch and I was supposed to speak after lunch and uh, he instructed uh, all participants uh, make sure you eat well, he's a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, uh, so I will try to uh, combine a legal or legalist discourse with um, uh, the problem of uh, political dissent and uh, um, also to not uh, explain or correct uh, some arguments I try to present uh, in my early work on uh, dissidence of law, on the problem of legitimacy, legality and the role of political dissent. Um, if we, uh, and, uh, so I will start by uh, talking about the concept, the notion of the rule of law and the concept of uh, human rights. I will briefly address um, uh, the notion of socialist legality and how should we analyze the concept of socialist legality. Then I shall um, uh, uh, talk briefly about the European dimension and, uh, of human rights and political dissent and uh, I will finally conclude by uh, talking about the function of political dissent in um, current global society in which um, uh, the concept of human rights is both. It's a moral sentiment or moral commitment, if you wish to say. At the same time, it's a technology of global governance. So how to reconcile this deep split and profound structural um, uh, irritation between this technological and pre-political um, aspect of human rights um, is, uh, is a major challenge for any, not just jurisprudence or legal philosophy, but also moral and political philosophy. And uh, I should say, it's, uh, uh, I almost feel guilty to talk uh, inside when the weather is so gorgeous. <laughs> and uh, I hope I'm not uh, now playing into uh, stereotypical images of people living in British islands, but when I was boarding the plane uh, yesterday evening in Bristol, it was seven degrees, heavy rain, and um, uh, yes, everybody was shivering while boarding. Yeah. And um, it's, uh, yeah, so, yeah, uh, please feel free to leave if you feel bored. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it's just a lawyer talk. Um, so, um, notion of rights or a discourse of rights today, it's, uh, it can be anything. We live in the age in which 
we are probably shaken by inflation of rights. Mm -hmm. People feel that there is too much talk about rights, and at the same time, there is not enough rights. What are we shaken by, or my, my recent um, you know, profound feeling of shaken, was that uh, when you, and this is something about the media and the role of social media, I'm, I'm speaking in favor of this media, because when you see buildings in Bangladesh uh, collapsing, and you check uh, where your uh, suit was made, and you realize it's made in Bangladesh, you say, I have responsibility for this. It's not just them or their poverty, it's my poverty as well. Spiritual and, uh, or my wealth is their poverty and vice versa. Um, it's, uh, uh, so the discourse of rights is um, uh, certainly globalized. But what is its history? Its history is certainly, um, yeah, we don't have to go uh, to the notion of French Revolution and criticize it from the perspective of either British radicals or conservatives. Is it nonsense upon stills, as Bentham would say, or is it uh, just another name of the emerging despotic state, as Edmund Burke would say? Yeah. Um, Nevertheless, this course of rights is with us. And um, the, uh, so I want to say, from the very beginning, the concept of rights has a profound structural role. After the Declaration of Independence in the American Constitution, and we know when those, uh, with a little bit of exaggeration, those Puritans, those Talibans, from uh, searched in uh, search in uh, uh, went in search of their promised land in 17th century, they realized that their ethics, their morality was so fundamental and fundamentalist that they cannot agree on it. What they can agree, nevertheless, on is the common notion of government under the rule of law under one constitution. We are the people, we, meaning we are the people of the Constitution. And Constitution, this is flexibility. What is great about law, I'm sorry to speak in favor of law, but the great thing about legality and law is that it provides you with certain flexibility that you can respond to social challenges. Unlike thinking, well, you are German because you speak German, you love Schubert, and uh, you read Goethe, and... You even can say you like Wagner. <laughs> and uh, no, if you are American, you have to fight for it. And it's flexibility of the Constitution which can expand and which can, um, yeah, uh, of course, the history of America, like of any other country, of any other nation, is both full of pride and shame. We shouldn't be surprised by this. However, what's great about it is there's an element of flexibility, and as we know from constitutional history, rights, the Bill of Rights, provided for certain safeguards. So flexibility means safeguards against government. It's my rights against you, government. So, and this structural tension is something which is typical of modern constitutional democracy. Um, Obviously, you know, the history of rights is the history of struggle, the history of permanent reconceptualizations, and history of profound shock. European civilization, and this is what is meant by the shaken, and the solidarity of the shaken, is, it's not a concept which would grow out of nowhere, it's a concept which is historically, politically, and ethically, um, uh, rooted in uh, European experience of two wars, holocaust, and complete collapse of European civilization. It's, uh, so that's why the concept of human rights, which emerged after 1945, emerged to co with the notion of human dignity. And human dignity is something which is ever more considered the basic norm, even for human rights. 
And uh, so why do we have rights? Because we are human beings. And we are human beings. And the fact that we are human beings means that we all have human dignity. And we all have the right to treatment which wouldn't violate our dignity. Uh, for a lawyer, this sounds fishy. Because how can you turn the concept of human dignity into legalistic discourse? However, I want to, so I, I want to make a first stop here and now go... Uh, so clearly, uh, post-1945, the uh, language and emergence of the discourse of rights is profoundly affected by the collapse, by shock, shell shock, and by the need to renew something which is valuable and which, but also valuable, yes, moral, but which can work. If you don't have government which is working, you, it can be called democratic, it can be called constitutional, and still it will collapse sooner or later. So you have to have a working government. Uh, an example of post-war renewal of Germany, it's not just an economic uh, success. It's, it's a miracle, of course. What is even a greater miracle is that Germans were learning their lesson, and it's one of the most stable constitutional democracies in Europe these days. With profound, with, with something which is which was the US invention, but it wasn't just coming out of um, uh, blue, but uh, which is the constitutional review. The power was out there, and Chief Justice Marshall was behaving like Lenin, but 100 years before him. Power was lying there, was waiting on the street. If you grab it, it's yours. And he grabbed it for the Supreme Court. And, it, and you have that shifts, that, uh, you have more activist courts, you have more restrictive courts. Nevertheless, the notion of constitutional review of legislation is there. And it, the constitutional review is the review from the perspective of human, of constitutional rights. It doesn't matter whether you call it human, constitutional, or natural. No, the, the, the main thing is it works. And it started working in Germany and other European states. And what is even more important is it emerged at international level, at the UN level, only uh, in the form of declaration and later on treaties, conventions. But in Europe, uh, what was fascinating to see was you had the project of European unification, which comes in two blocks. Economic unification, which means basically um, uh, if you have the community of coal and steel, you have the control of um, uh, military industry. And uh, if you have the control of military industry, you are guaranteed um, uh, the best protection against any hostilities, at least within Western Europe, and of course in the divided Europe, it, uh, it then uh, uh, strengthens your position in the Cold War. Um, at the same time, if you have the Council of Europe, the idea, the original idea for Council of Europe was that the European project will emerge as two institutions merging into one European building. Council of Europe was to provide for political um, uh, uh, integration uh, from early 50s and um, it didn't work in the end for many reasons. So we don't have time to talk about it here, but uh, uh, what worked nevertheless was exactly what uh, Martin was talking about, uh, was uh, the emergence of the European Convention of Human Rights. And with the European Convention of Human Rights, which again started as a very modest project, and uh, uh, but the European Court of Human Rights and its review of the convention became an um, intrinsic part of political and legal culture of post-war Europe. Today, we are mad at European Court of Human Rights. It's taking uh, our powers. 
British Eurosceptics are famous for loathing on the, uh, the court. If you're a Czech, you think, hmm, it's great to have a review, a judicial review of even top institutions, or top national institutions. However, who do we send to the court is another matter. Mm -hmm. yeah? I don't have to go into big details, I don't want to get personal, but representatives, national representatives um, uh, at the court are a big problem. And even the most liberal and left-wing um, solicitors uh, would tell you, since Russia joined, the Strasbourg case law went downhill. You know, the, the jurisprudence and juris, uh, um, uh, uh, and case law uh, ratio decidendi uh, uh, ratio uh, decidendi uh, um, uh, deteriorate. The quality went downhill. But it's a technical issue. Uh, if you look at the structure, it's there. And now um, the rosy picture stops because I mentioned the divided Europe. And another shock. Is, uh, the first shock is, yes, wars, holocaust, and uh, uh, totalitarianism. Second shock is, the, Europe is divided, and what's going beyond <coughs> the Iron Curtain, the big question is, can you call it the rule of law? If you read Stalin's Constitution of 1936, the text is wonderful. Who wouldn't live to live? Who wouldn't want to live in a country like that? It's a paradise. Just at the time when the Moscow trials um, uh, were about to begin and the biggest purges, um, uh, well, yeah, the biggest, yeah, what is the biggest in the normal history, but uh, uh, you get the constitution, the text, a legal document which is which reads like mm, this is this is the right balance. Forget about liberalism, this is the right balance between rights and responsibilities or rights and duties. This is usually what conservatives like to talk about. The, the, uh, the discourse of rights um, is uh, undermined or undermines uh, the fabric, the social fabric. And uh, Stalin is also like to talk about uh, duties. Everybody has the right, but you have a duty. You have the right to job, unlike in capitalism. But you have a duty to work. Yeah. Try to talk to Chinese communists or capital communists um, uh, that uh, uh, they will tell you something similar. And um, uh, so, if we want to analyze, and uh, so the question is, is or are the systems, the legal systems, emerging uh, in the East Bloc, are they rule of law systems? Or are they not? And uh, here I have, a, I have a very, very peculiar story. Uh, when I was younger, so much younger than today, uh, I needed anybody uh, to tell me what the rule of law is. And uh, I was at a conference in Oxford, and you know, um, uh, Oxford professors, how wonderful they are. They, they, you almost don't spot their snobbery, yeah? and, but it is there. And one of them, quite distinguished person, said, I've just returned from a post-communist, uh, from um, uh, a series of lectures uh, that I gave in post-communist theater. I really don't know what was going on there. Everybody was talking about the rule of law as if it was some idea. <laughs> well, the rule of law is basically any government governed by laws. <laughs> yeah. So he was exasperated by the fact that people in East uh, Europe, in post communist Europe, treat the rule of law as a, a value based concept, as a concept with strong moral meaning. Because we all know, especially we Brits know, we don't need any constitution, because we know that the rule of law is any government, is dicey. Any government uh, which is under the law is the rule of law. Well, not always. Yeah. 
if, and the story and history of 20th century, and in British islands, they don't realize it that much, despite the fact that in some islands, they also deported their Jewish co-citizens, those occupied, uh, uh, because they don't, uh, they, don't, they, are, uh, they don't reflect on the simple fact that in 20th century, law became just another name for crime. Law became just another name for crime against humanity. And law, and the due process of law, became just another name for the worst political terror. So we have to step back, breathe out, and rethink our jurisprudence. We don't have to jump into moralist conclusions, but we have to ask a very different question. What makes the rule of law the rule of law? And the answer can be like uh, what a great sociologist and philosopher of law uh, from Poland gave, uh, Adam von Goretzky, gave. You have to go in search of the basic norm uh, of the legal system. The basic norm is Hans Kelsen's invention. Hans Kelsen, it's, uh, uh, Hans Kelsen is a, uh, another peculiar Central European. Um, talking of Central European legacy, you have many different legacies. Um, and Hans Kelsen first was born in Prague, but the house where he was born, uh, you would be looking for it in vain because it ended up, uh, 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 again, it's, history took its course, it's where the metro uh, station Narodny is today. Is it? All oh, right, so it's something new. Uh, but Hans Kelsen then became uh, a famous jurist um, of the um, pure theory of law, which is a very idiosyncratic piece of jurisprudence. I certainly wouldn't endorse it uh, myself. Nevertheless, he asked a, a, a profound question. What is the basic law, uh, and what is the basic norm determines the structure of the whole system? And he was also a practicing lawyer. People don't realize he was uh, a judge at the Constitu sitting at the Constitutional Court in Austria until 1930. And uh, then, of course, he was pushed away as a social democrat and uh, as a Jew. And then later he took a flight and ended up uh, uh, teaching in Berkeley, but not at the law school. Lawyers in America wouldn't allow anybody, any legal philosopher from Central Europe, teaching there. So he ended up teaching at the Faculty of Political Science, School of Political Science. However, we can use this methodology and ask what is what makes a big difference between the liberal notion of the rule of law or the constitutional democratic state and the socialist legality or socialist. And the answer is the basic norm which draws on, not just on formal legality, but on substantive notion, classes. You know, Marxists define uh, law as uh, political will of the ruling class. We can discard it because Marxists, uh, and Marx uh, was interested. He wanted to write a theory of uh, law, uh, but he never uh, completed this uh, enterprise. Um, later on, early in the socialist state uh, and socialist legality, uh, um, communists always looked suspiciously on law and the system of law. And early legal theorists of the socialist or the communist Russia, they believed that the law will wither away together with the state. You have to have the period of terror, after which you will have the dictatorship, it will be very brief, and then you will what will disappear will be the state will disappear, law will disappear, and society will be self-administered. Classness will disappear, and classless socialist society will establish harmonious uh, social relationships. Obviously, this was then reverted by uh, Vyshinsky's and uh, Vyshinsky's theory of. Um, uh, um, and um, uh, 
class struggle emerging at the uh, uh, national and international level, and the classness became the basic norm. So the classness um, uh, is the ba uh, uh, and the classness uh, really makes a big difference. And you, that's why you cannot call the system the rule of law system. If you, uh, um, uh, uh, the concept of classness means that law always has to be interpreted from the perspective of interests of the working class as represented by the Communist Party. Um, a great jurist of 20th century Public, Victor Knapp. Uh, actually, in 1959, uh, Victor, uh, for uh, um, uh, foreign guests, uh, Victor Knapp is a Czech Karl Schmidt, <laughs> <laughs> a very, very talented and intelligent uh, legal theorist. Nevertheless, obsessed with power and service, like Karl Schmidt. Like Karl Schmidt, who in 1932 called for the ban on Nazis and communists, and a year later uh, he declared that, um, that the state is protected by a fear. And uh, Viktor Knapp wrote a very powerful critique of uh, the Nazi legal system in 1947, I think only a couple of years later to uh, come up uh, as a, a young, ambitious lawyer drafting communist legislation during the transition period to the totalitarian state. And in 1959, he made this famous remark that classness is a unique contribution of socialist legality to the history of law. Okay. Uh, I certainly don't want to make any cheap uh, moral uh, criticisms um, or rants against uh, Viktor Knapp uh, because he was a fine mind, uh, but um, uh, we have to bear in mind that, and this is a great illustration that law in 20th century is not just innocent formal legality driven, it's always <coughs> dirty of politics. And uh, uh, socialist legality, uh, we can Clearly, the uh, history of totalitarianism is much more dynamic than, um, um, uh, and, and, uh, uh, the problem is uh, how to analyze different periods of history of uh, socialist legality. After a brief period of Stalinist uh, lawmaking and uh, open repression, then repression becomes much more selective. Um, I think we all uh, have seen the film. Um, uh, oh, I'm running out of time. Um, uh, uh, we've seen the film. Um, uh, okay, okay. Uh, uh, Lives of Others. What is great about the film is actually the history behind it. 1953, you have an up uh, uprising in uh, East Berlin. And the uprising is crushed. There's blood, workers' blood on streets of the workers' state in Germany. This is a moment when, uh, 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 when um, um, Bertolt uh, uh, Becht uh, says that the government should choose different people. Yeah. And it's a breaking moment because the government realizes we can't ruled by open repression. We had to establish, we had to constitute surveillance state. Long time before Foucault's discipline and punish and acts of surveillance, you have this shift towards selective repression and surveillance as a major technique of disciplinization of population. And um, uh, Socialist legality was part of this much larger project of governmentality by repressive uh, uh, um, government. Um, at the same time, so, so we have two processes here. 
Europe is heading for law, uh, human rights as technicality to be governed by the European Court of Human Rights, by the European Convention. There is a um, declaration of human rights, by the way, inspired by Kelsen, and the UN was drafted also or under uh, Kelsen's uh, spaces in San Francisco Opera House. And uh, so you have this whole new political and constitutional drive towards human rights emerging at international, European, and also national level. Uh, the fact the constitutional review of constitutional rights is a novelty even in Europe. Yes, Europe had its constitutional review before the war, but it was limited to political process. Now, it is constitutional review of constitutional rights. And in Germany, you have a magnificent, a groundbreaking, landmark decision, Lut, in which the court says, principles of constitutional democratic state in Germany are not merely positivistic. They are mean, and they have suprapositivist foundations. So, what the judges say early on, they say, constitutional democracy is based on the notion of human rights, or constitutional rights, and what these rights are is established by principles, and these principles don't have to be written in the constitution. They have even, um, now even, uh, the, the Czech public knows it, especially after the landmark decision uh, in Melchak, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, in which even the Czech constitutional court declared that uh, uh, there is a substantive core of the constitution. And what is substantive core of democratic constitutionalism? It is up to us to decide. And we can overturn even constitutional laws of parliament should they be contradicting this particular article of the constitution. It's, ah, in some countries, this is judicial activism going mad. Yeah. Or going Melchar, yeah, I should say, because Melchar is really a landmark. But in Germany, the same or very similar thing happened. It's a nuclear device of judges against the legislature. It has to be used wisely. But it's great that we have it now. As constitutional judges, uh, and Czech constitutional judges follow the example of German, but also Austrian judges. So there is core, substantive core of constitutional democracy, which who decides? Who is the decision maker? So you have the, and it's a process. It's a technique, if you wish to say. I'm sorry to speak from the pers uh, perspective of technicality. But then, so, so you have an increasing culture of rights turning into juridical and political technique. In the other half, uh, you have the notion of socialist rights corresponding with socialist duties, which everybody knows doesn't work. Because law isn't so important. Nobody would be reading judgments of the Supreme Court of Hungary, Poland, <coughs> until the mid 80s at least, Poland. But, because the law didn't matter. I'm sorry to say so, but uh, in, um, uh, it's. Uh, it's no great achievement that women are reasonably well represented in judicial professions in post-communist Europe. It's only the consequence of the unimportant, relative unimportance uh, of law under communism. So the sexism is still there, it's only because, and uh, gender discrimination is there, it's only because when I studied in the late 80s still, I felt like a um, uh, gender minority yeah, in, uh, in law school. But, uh, and right after the revolution, it changed. The ratio changed. Yeah. So it's, uh, uh, but, uh, 
the unimportance of law has to be studied together and is a consequence of the basic norm. However, the world is changing and with uh, uh, changes at international law, uh, level, uh, especially post-1968, when it's clear that, uh, yes, it's a complete uh, moral uh, collapse of a uh, socialist project uh, that even uh, you have the new generation of philosophers in France uh, uh, who are, yes, South said that 1956 and 1968, uh, 1956 in Hungary and 1968 in Czechoslovakia um, uh, uh, meant uh, the end of any. Um, hopes uh, for the socialist alternative coming from Moscow. But uh, there were other uh, philosophers who were much more critical, and also critical of the Stalinist past, of the, uh, for instance, of the French life. And this is the moment when human rights discourse turned, uh, uh, um, uh, is, uh, is turning into an international politics, and especially European politics. Because uh, now you have Russian tanks uh, at Czech-German borders, 200 kilometers to Munich, uh, and you need to uh, sort out um, uh, uh, the problem of security and disarmament. And the Helsinki Accords, this is an international law document, and the Helsinki Accords uh, was about security, uh, disarmament, security, economic cooperation, and then third basket, exactly. Third basket, it's, and again, it's a technique. And it was uh, because of skills of, uh, I think it was Dutch and some Scandinavian diplomats, yeah, and uh, who simply squeezed in the third basket. Um, it's, uh, and the human rights. And the human rights became, and this is interesting how the technique, because communist countries thought, oh, this is a price we can negotiate, uh, we can pay because uh, we negotiate much better deal here. We won't be squeezed by um, military uh, industry at much, uh, or challenged by military industry. We will get some forms of cooperation and uh, uh, we don't have to care about it. However, people who care were dissidents. Because political dissent, yes, there was political dissent, political opposition. And ever more dissent, the story of dissent is the story of a gradual incorporation and adoption of the human rights language. And it's a and again, it's a technique. And here I come to political dissent uh, that Charter 77 is magnificent uh, for many different reasons and, and, and truly historical uh, uh, movement because it first formulated this simple truth. We ask our government to uphold these particular rights and international law obligations to which it subscribed. It's a legalist argument. And if you read Charter 77 today, usually when I give it to read to my British or American students, they are, they are surprised why such a modestly drawn document could spark <laughs> such a fierce reaction. Yeah. And obviously, this is a document in which human rights strategy is telling more basic truth. The emperor is naked. And uh, this is what I try to describe as, um, uh, in that book as a, um, a strategy of uh, uh, simply uh, confronting socialist legality as a facade of profoundly illegitimate forms of repressive governance and surveillance. Um, and it's interesting that my argument then... Um, huh, uh, interesting that uh, um, this argument uh, wasn't uh, 
was initially ignored by legal theorists, but uh, uh, the, the topic of legitimacy and legitimation is a recurrent topic, so yeah, it's, it keeps coming back. And uh, 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 some people were critical, saying, well, of course Czechoslovakia had its laws, and dissidents were using existing laws, and therefore their struggle was a positivistic struggle. They were engaged in but would you really believe that these people, drafters or dissidents, took such high risk and personal existential trouble to prove merely the fact that Czechoslovak government is in breach of its own obligations? This is a naivety. No. There is a more profound story to be told. And the story is this government is illegitimate. Its legality, its notion of legality is profoundly discriminatory. And therefore, this notion of socialist legality has to be completely revisited if it wants to achieve some minimum level of international recognition and that's, that's an interesting step, because after a uh, period of repressions, uh, <coughs> uh, or, uh, of course, Charles and Bissell wasn't the only one. You have core, you have um, dissident organizations in Soviet Union, in Bulgaria, and all of a sudden, the end of the 1970s is a profound change in the dissident narrative. Now the narrative is fully uh, entrenched in the discourse of rights, and also supported by international organizations. And you, uh, it's, uh, of course, times are changing, uh, it's a banality, but um, <laughs> uh, it's the times when the Amnesty International has this profoundly Quaker ethos. You write as an individual on behalf of another individual to the government of that persecuted individual to ask for to ask the government for rethink. Today, and I have some friends who are yeah, uh, very very much engaged in the Amnesty International uh, business. But today, Amnesty International is a big uh, global NGO uh, facilitating or uh, advocating particular policies. So it's a policy think tank, rather than an ethical organization, but um, it's, um, yeah, and, and that's why some people speak about uh, moral bankruptcy of the Amnesty International, and Amnesty International gets uh, many more uh, uh, criticisms than ever in the past. But uh, this, is, this is also important for the story of uh, socialist legality and political dissent. And um, clearly, the discourse of rights is becoming not just European, European Convention, but also now behind the Iron Curtain, this is the discourse of dissent, which is becoming ever more voiceful. And at international level, you already have two conventions. You have the, um, uh, uh, you have the covenant on uh, um, uh, political rights, and you also have the covenant on social and economic rights. It's uh, uh, 1966 and 1976. And so the political dissent through the language of rights, profoundly shakes the basic norm of socialist legality to such extent that by 1985, with uh, that uh, strange secretary general uh, in the uh, Soviet Union who, has, who was completely mistaken, unlike Chinese communists, fortunately for us, and it's, it must be hard to become secretary general of the Communist Party if you are probably a socialist or social democrat. Uh, but uh, if you remember, 
1986, and Gorbachev comes with those uh, some very uh, laughable campaigns like uh, mm, uh, uh, stop drinking campaigns and uh, glasnost, perestroika. But at the same time, he makes a very early speech in which he says the rule of law is a concept which we share. He was definitely reading those political theories of convergence. Yeah. And it's funny because uh, convergence theories of the 1960s believed that we will, uh, socialist and capitalist uh, societies will merge through technology and administration. That managers, this is the managers revolution. And now you have the Secretary General of the Soviet Union who says, it's not just through technology, because well, by the 80s, yes, uh, you look at uh, Germany, one uh, nation divided by the states, and uh, one country produces Mercedes, the other produces Trump. Yeah. What is the technology talk about? This is a complete collapse. Yeah? If you have a plastic car um, uh, for which you have to uh, um, wait uh, up to, I don't know, 15 years was it? It, it was really like uh, the children got listed on waiting list to queue for Trabant. Uh, so technology, you can't speak about the convergence of technologies, but uh, Gorbachev comes with convergence of moral concepts. <coughs> and this is, of course, you can't, if you pretend that you are morally superior, you are the camp of the future of humankind, you cannot do this. You lose your point of reference. So the concept of rights turned out to be so subversive <coughs> that it led communists to lose their own language. The moment you lose your own language, you lose your power. Yeah. And this is the story of dissent in the sense of uh, um, uh, subversive um, political strategy which changes but is this providing for some, uh, or political dissents, are they providing for some different basic norms? And that's interesting. It's not a, an alternative basic norm. What political dissent successfully proves is that in open liberal societies, legitimacy is never a given. Legitimacy is always a process. Uh, Martin said uh, very persuasively um, in his uh, opening remarks that it's a performative. It's a you you have to share certain understanding, but distance is a performative. It's an event, and it's a therefore it's a permanent intellectual and normative challenge. And if I uh, and I want to conclude uh, by these remarks, uh, um, it's uh, if, if there is something special about this, and it's what Patochka describes as this negative warning voice. It doesn't have a positive normative structure. No, the value of this is in its daemonion as a negative warning. This is Socrates, simply. I will follow the laws of the of polis, of the Athenian city. I will follow them to the extreme to prove they are unjust. And my I my life is a witness to this profound injustice. This being witness to profound injustice is very important. But it's, uh, it's important morally, but at the same time it's important technically. Because dissidents always stopped communists from achieving the totalitarian legitimacy of their law. They were permanently challenged. They always had to confront dissent, and by confronting dissent, they delegitimized their own system. With every campaign, against the um, document of uh, uh, Charter 77 or CORE, communists were losing even the minimum legitimacy that they could have hoped for. So this is this negativity uh, which is so important 
and which turns, in the end, legitimacy into permanent process of legitimation. Something which is, uh, so that, yes, legitimation is always in the making, in the process, which makes uh, a, a, a profound difference even to the structure of sovereignty and constitutional democratic state, or structures which are beyond state. Which means that, and this is what we heard, what was so important, that sovereignty isn't ultimate power and decision-making power. Sovereignty is ultimate responsibility. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you. Let me start the discussion with a short compliment I got uh, over here. Uh, the quote from the preamble to the European Convention on uh, Human Rights. Uh, uh, the government, uh, this is a project created by governments of European countries which are like minded and have a common heritage of political traditions, ideas, freedoms, and the rule of law. Have resolved from other things to take first steps for the quality and enforcement of certain of the rights stated in the Universal Declaration. So this is the key concept here, and it really is puzzling is like-mindedness. Uh, I would rather translate it uh, not as a same mind, but homo rea, as a uh, certain similarity. Uh, that's why uh, totalitarian countries could not, uh, uh, with their socialist legality, be bound, because they were everything uh, but not like-minded. And this like-mindedness, I think, is, uh, and then obviously uh, you mentioned this German case. And uh, if I remember well, there is this conflict of democracy being able to defend itself. Uh, that's why Germans, uh, after having their own experience with totalitarianism, uh, then uh, they were inclined to uh, introduce both robots uh, and uh, uh, to get rid of some teachers uh, that uh, were members of the Communist Party because uh, uh, they wanted to have democracy, uh, maybe, and these were cases uh, within the area of freedom of expression and uh, so on and so forth. So this was, uh, Paul, after 1990, there is a, this famous Stanoka case and others before the court, European court, uh, in which the question was to which extent people who were uh, participating in the democratic process are to be uh, given full uh, participation uh, in this uh, uh, like mind, uh, making uh, their countries like minded. Uh, very quickly, three things. Uh, uh, I think they are uh, basic stones of the doctrine. The concepts that are applied by the European Court in the past uh, as a concept uh, in the context of European supervision must be autonomous, which means uh, that they should not, they should be uh, tested against the convention and not against the domestic uh, uh, laws. Uh, uh, that's why all sovereignist arguments that this is our law uh, is not valid. Because if you are a member of the system of the convention, convention is what uh, matters. Then a very radical uh, aspect of, uh, I would say, this uh, uh, judicial activism is so-called evolutive interpretation. Uh, what is recognized by the court is that it's not only theological interpretation which is uh, valid, which means uh, with the respect to the purpose, but uh, under the new circumstances, uh, you can uh, you can come up uh, to very new conclusions because things are changing, and then obviously there is a certain break for that. This is the doctrine of margins of appreciation, which means that uh, European supervision should respect domestic courts with certain margins. They should not seek, I would say, homogenization. Uh, that it uh, must be perfectly clear that the uh, situation in Innsbruck with uh, uh, their, uh, I would say, maybe more rigid Catholic morality uh, must be tolerated uh, by Europeans from Amsterdam uh, who might have different, uh, more relaxed attitudes uh, towards certain things. Uh, so I think this type of flexibility, diversity and permanent process is uh, the key element of it. And it's extremely interesting that the court doctrine has evolved especially after 1990. Not so much that uh, uh, new countries were generating uh, uh, these interesting cases, but that the whole process got into a very, very dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's my comment. Mm -hmm. Shall I briefly? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, first off, thank you very much for this. It's uh, uh, the concept of uh, mili uh, uh, the, so the democracy defending itself. Yes, uh, self-defending democracy. It is a notion from uh, the German constitution. Uh, we uh, or the right to resistance. You have the constitutional right for resistance, which is uh, every legalist uh, or even uh, political sovereignist would say, "Oh, this is nonsense." How can you resist uh, if you are under the sovereign authority? Uh, but uh, it's related to the concept of militant democracy um, invoked by uh, political scientist Levenstein when uh, uh, German refugees were flocking to um, a free part of Europe and the United States. And um, it was 1941, the, the essay on militant democracy, when uh, Levenstein published the essay. And he said the problem with uh, the Nazi uh, Germany was that it uh, that the power gave too much space to the parties which wanted to destroy the Weimar constitutional regime. And Levenstein argued if we had more militant democracy, more self-defending democracy, we could have saved the Weimar from the Nazis. Mm -hmm. It would just require more robust action on the side of Democrats, top judicial bodies, <coughs> and on extremist parties. And this is something which, uh, of course, it's, a, it's like a sword. It has, it's a double edge. Because this notion was then involved during the McCarthyism in the United States, but at the same time, so of course, who are the enemies of the state? But at the same time, in post-war Germany, it worked for, uh, as a tool of denazification. And of course, uh, the case Vogt uh, uh, was uh, um, a famous case in which uh, 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 where the communist uh, party members uh, could be banned from, uh, from teaching in, um, because teaching is the same uh, for the same yeah, but in public schools. Uh, it's the same like with Scientology, yeah, that uh, uh, can they teach uh, uh, in Germany. Um, so this is the notion of militant democracy, and this is something which even the Czech Constitution Court uh, quoted in its um, Lustration 2 case in 2001, when they said, uh, because the last, uh, so again for foreign guests, lustration it's, uh, it has nothing to do with ancient uh, Roman uh, ritual of uh, seeing into future, and uh, it's a ritual slaughter of bulls in ancient Rome. <laughs> We uh, ritually slaughtered uh, enemies of the new democracy in 1991 by illustration law, which came into effect in 1992, as a, exactly as an extraordinary legal measure taken to, to protect the new regime from the old representatives of the state. By the way, they are in, uh, introducing the same law in Libya these days. Yeah? <laughs> uh, the law was, of course, we have to say it was a discriminatory law discriminating against certain people from the old regime from taking jobs in the new regime. And that's why it was justified by it's temporary for five years only. And it's a measure which is limited to public offices, not to private businesses, unlike in Germany. Of course, the law was then extended for another five years, and when it was uh, to be extended yet again, it was um, um, uh, then uh, taken to the court, and in its uh, illustration two case, the court says it, the conditions, extraordinary conditions for this law still are still in place, but at the same time, the court reserved the right to review the uh, law any time in the future. Well, so this is about militant democracy and controversy surrounding the very concept. Um, um, uh, when it comes to uh, margin of appreciation, yes. This is a big problem uh, of uh, how, much can you, uh, how much can you integrate uh, and uh, Europe through the juridical discourse and or through legal integration by the Council of Europe or by the European Court of Justice. Um, um, I mean the EU court, not, not the European Court of Human Rights. It's Strasbourg and Luxembourg working together. Um, 
And marginal appreciation is a doctrine which plays an increasing role and uh, which uh, is uh, <coughs> problematic um, because it, um, it acknowledges legal cultural differences. I'm not talking about cultural differences as general, but also differences in legal culture. <coughs> because if you have British judges, they would feel strongly obliged to apply any judgment enacted by the court in Strasbourg. And all politicians would follow this suit. That's why every time there is a problem with uh, religious fanatics in France, and next uh, week, uh, uh, like last year, after that um, uh, lone wolf uh, killed um, uh, Jewish kids and uh, Muslim um, uh, soldier, French soldiers, uh, um, right after they caught him, they immediately, the French state immediately deported four hate preachers back to Senegal. And the British press was mad, said, they are under the same convention, how come they can do it and we can't? Yeah, that mm -hmm. Abu Katada is here for years. And of course, because no British politician would go against the judicial ruling. Yeah. It's, uh, so you have different uh, uh, legal cultures, and uh, but I wanted to say one important uh, so, uh, there is a principle of subsidiarity and there are limits to what the court in Strasbourg can do without dismantling the thin fabric of uh, European culture of rights and the current drive of, uh, for instance, in Britain against the Strasbourg court is both dangerous but uh, it can be explained against this background of the lack of margin of like the prisoners' uh, rights, etc. Okay, but I should stop here. Okay, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, how do you see uh, this uh, particular, uh, this production of, uh, of laws for particular groups, like, for example, solar, uh, solar energy laws, uh, uh, SCARs, and so on? Um, and uh, uh, do we, as uh, humankind, as people, have the right uh, to have uh, good governance uh, and how to execute this right? You have responsibility to have, well, I would say good government is a um, difficult problem. I always like to, uh, I always uh, prefer to talk about uh, um, uh, fair government. Yeah, and, and, and the right government. This was a source of my uh, recent critical exchange with uh, uh, the deputy president of the Czech Constitutional Court, in which, uh, uh, who is uh, one of the most distinguished legal theorists in the country. Uh, yet I was absolutely surprised when I said, well, it, uh, of course, in the liberal uh, rule of law, you always have to follow the concept of right, not the concept of good. And I received a response, public response from him, no, we judges have to care for good. Yeah. And I was astonished, he was astonished, and uh, we did a very nice book, I think, uh, in the end. And, um, uh, uh, but uh, um, I think to, 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 uh, to, to answer your question, I think... Um, Rights, and, and this is, uh, Martin was talking about post-European, maybe we could talk even about post-humanist humanism. This shift from humanism to human rights is something which is typical uh, also, for instance, of the French philosophy in the 70s, and even the radical philosophy. So maybe maybe um, we, maybe humanism is dead. But it doesn't mean that, or bankrupt, how can you talk about humanism, face to face uh, the tragedies and uh, disasters and civilizational uh, uh, disasters, uh, but human rights is something which is post-human, because you believe that if you 
face certain injustice. You, you don't, in other words, you don't argue from the position of justice, you argue from the position of injustice. Why political dissidents in Eastern Europe? And it's fascinating that this was an argument of a radicals in France, like Michel Foucault, forget about it. humanity is dead, but yet I will go and fight for the rights of prisoners. And I will go and support solidarity in Poland. <coughs> because the fact that um, uh, man is dead doesn't mean that we will do nothing. No? It's interesting that it's uh, something which links even people from the opposite political spectrum. Like, if you, if you look at uh, famous conservative uh, uh, lawyers in the United States, like Alan Dershowitz, he would say, no, we, we don't have the concept of humanity, but we know what's wrong. So our concept of rights is not defined by the knowledge of humanity, but by knowledge of what is unjust and inhuman. That's interesting change and shift. Rather than talking like we are humanists and we are superior and we can tell you what is good, good, what is bad. No. We will talk about injustice and through yeah. 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 In favor of militant democracy, as you yes. explained. Yes. Yes. It's, it's yes. typical, it's practically on the philosophy of uh, Rougemont that uh, everyone has the right uh, to, to have the power. That means uh, everyone uh, can uh, consider anything uh, injust <laughs> unjustified. I think what is great about federalism is um, the notion of government. Is it many great things about America. One of them is that when you say anarchists, uh, you don't necessarily mean uh, uh, left-wing people with Che Guevara on a t-shirt and uh, Che Guevara t-shirt made in Bangladesh. And uh, it's, uh, uh, you also mean about capitalist anarchists, yeah, people who don't believe in government, who believe in market or values and uh, strong respons individual responsibility and so on. And um, not that I would endorse one or the other, but um, uh, in Federalist Papers, you have this very strong belief in the rule of law, which is written into a document, which is the basic law. And at the same time, this law is, this document defines not just government, it's not the definition of government, it's the definition of a relationship between the government and its people. And it's a notion of a limited government. Uh, American Revolution is walking in a revolution. So limited government, government always lustrated by the rights which are pre-political, which nevertheless are always contested in the political contest and in the legal process, in the due process of law. This is, uh, for, for this reason, I always um, like to point uh, uh, the debate between Ronald Borkin and feminists about pornography. And uh, pornography uh, in, in the <coughs> 70s, and you know that feminists, they are like uh, ultra-conservatives. They know what is good for you. Yeah. So it's uh, this this notion of always we have to beware moralism in law and politics. It's not saying we should be moral. Um, uh, we should be we should be immoral. No, but we should have certain minimum notion of moral skepticism of David Hume. We should we should beware moralists when they have these spells. And, and Borkin argued very powerfully for saying that, well, this is not for the Constitution to say what is good and to define what is good. It's, the, the Constitution can tell you what is right, not what is good. Yeah. And this is something which, uh, which, makes, uh, which makes the notion of rights uh, not just part of the legalist battles, legal battles, but also part of um, what we may refer to as political morality of a certain community. And, um, and the question is, if you, if you have the notion of right, we don't know what rights are, we don't know the substance, 
but we know it can always be contested and established and determined by the structures that federalists were so keen on preserving and promoting. Okay. Considerably side has been strengthened very much now, and I'm looking forward to Roman Yoko. <laughs> <laughs> I have arrived too late, so I cannot have any remarks on the substance of your presentation. I just I had a chance to listen to, to the discussion, and I have two questions. The first concerns uh, the attitude that we don't need to know what's good, what's an objective good, or what's the concept, right concept of humanity. But we just know what injustices are. Mm -hmm. But how can we know what injustices are if we don't know what is just? <laughs> how can we know uh, which prisoners are in prison justly and rightly, like for example Karl Hess in Spandau or Paul Pot in anywhere in prison. And how we know how some prisoners have been incarcerated unjustly without a concept, a convincing concept of an absolute objective justice, rights, natural rights and so on, which are not changeable mm -hmm. by just pure human will. So this is the first question. And the second question or remark uh, the discussion of fighting democracy, that the democratic constitutional regime should have a fighting chance to survive vis-à-vis -vis extremely anti-liberal or even totalitarian alternatives. Of course, the concept has been refreshed after the World War II uh, in German legal and philosophic environment. But if we look at the origins of that concept, you have mentioned that those were located mm -hmm. uh, based on concept of basic natural rights, which are primary, and then governments are secondary and based only on contracts. So if you have a movement which would like, by its intentions, political program, to violate and suppress some of the basic natural rights of individuals, then from the local perspective, you have just an absolute right to suppress that movement. Uh, either by preventing it coming to power, like this and franchise with them, don't accept them to free elections, or if the prudence dictates that the chances are quite severe that the movement would succeed, you can suppress its propaganda and so on and so on. So your denigratory remark on McCarthy uh, has indeed been a double-edged. Of course, McCarthy was a politician and a populist at that, but philosophically speaking, he was more in the tradition of founding fathers and of John Locke's concept of objective natural rights then his democratic opponents who were by Mario left relativism. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so this is okay. Uh, this will this will be now a conversation between Czech conservatives and liberals. And uh, my response would be uh, this is uh, yes, clearly uh, we have different views here because for me justice uh, isn't the definition of good. Justice is definition of what's right and fair. And this is the liberal notion of uh, um, uh, justice. Um, you, yes, you can start uh, from Rawls. And uh, I, what I love about Rawls is that it's such a beautiful story of, uh, re um, of retelling the social contract theory. Yeah. This, is, this is great about Rawls. We don't know what is good. We don't know what is good. But if we are given this chance, this thought experiment, we know it's a, it's a construct. But if we are left with just our reason, me, rather than reason with yeah, capital letter, with the reasoning, we can negotiate society which is just, which is fair, even if we profoundly disagree on the notion of good. That's why I, I, uh, early uh, in my talk I mentioned uh, um, uh, early pilgrims and um, uh, Mayflower 1620 and, and of course those people were Puritans and they were religious fundamentalists. Yeah, very, very, yeah, they, they, yeah. Uh, scripturalist and uh, yes, they were Christian Taliban's of the time. But what was great about them was that they successfully established the dividing line between private and public. And the definition between private and public is the definition between 
good <coughs> justice. Yeah? And so this is uh, clearly uh, we would disagree on this, and I would strongly endorse the notion of rights as representing the idea of fairness and justice rather than common good. This is when rights trump good. Yeah? And what is right trumps what is good. Yeah? Because we may be um, um, yeah, uh, in favor of some establishment. Uh, for instance, today uh, a big challenge for um, uh, Anglican Church uh, in uh, uh, Britain is, is should it be the state church? And, and of course, I, I always wonder why simply the Archbishop of Canterbury doesn't say, fine, we're leaving. You won't leave. And the Queen could do the same. <laughs> and uh, uh, I wonder whether Britain would then transform into a sort of uh, Americanized democracy or uh, rather uh, something much nastier. Um, uh, 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 so, uh, yes, yeah, so that's why the argument of injustice is important because it tells you what isn't right. Yeah. Uh, uh, the second question, Milton, democracy, uh, or the democracy defending itself, uh, I wouldn't call um, uh, McCarthy um, uh, part of uh, his policy, part of Lockean legacy. I would say he is Schmittian. He's very much Schmittian. We decide who are enemies of the state. And um, Again, in my talk, I was talking. Schmidt has this notion, of, or had this notion of uh, um, legitimacy takes priority over legality, as we know. Decision has political decision is more important than the normative structure of legality. This is his famous uh, dispute with Heller and others, and uh, and uh, <coughs> Schmidt uh, is still very very. Um, uh, inspiring for not just conservative thinkers but for the radical left. Exactly because he would sweep aside law by in the state of emergency. Yeah. And, um, and for him, obviously, then the question, then the first question of politics is who represents the sovereign, the people? And, whether, and, and of course, it is the leader, it is the president, it can be president, yeah. he would be, he would, yeah, all oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, uh, uh, my colleague, Hase Hoffmann, a German fine philosopher of law, uh, says, Ho uh, uh, Schmidt would make a perfect ideologue of the Fifth Republic in France. Yeah. And, um, in, uh, in the broadcast or two. Yep. <laughs> But, um, but the problem with Schmidt is that he believes that there is one voice with which the sovereign can speak. And political dissent, and the legacy of political dissent is exactly in this. This voice is permanently contested, and contestation is what makes democracy. That's why in the end McCarthy had to lose. <laughs> And that's why any patriot act is only a temporary irritation in the country with the First Amendment. Yeah? And that's why um, uh, political dissidents are interested. Uh, that's why you have left or right Schmittians, but political dissidents prove that Schmidt was right on the role of um, uh, politics in law, but completely wrong on giving the ultimate voice to one uh, uh, political body representing the state. A quick reaction, but because that uh, energy is I, I would, well, I have no sympathy for, for Schmidt. I consider him to be very dangerous for the reasons you have mentioned. But I, I think you would have been right on McCarthy. Had his position been, he had to decide who enemies are. Had that decision been arbitrary, completely, but in my understanding, his position was slightly different. We have American creed, Declaration of Independence. We claim objective truth. And communists just are not enemies because we don't like them. 
but they are enemies because they deny those true objective truth. And that's why they are not fit to, to, to govern in a free and democratic society. So, so the criteria are, are not just, just arbitrary will, but objective standards of rule, like encapsulated in, uh, in the Declaration of Independence. Do have a last word? Let's uh, uh, Hendrik. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for a fascinating presentation and interesting discussion. Uh, I have a lot of sympathy for your Morkinian view of rights as Trump's. But at the same time, and I think that came out beautifully in the quote from Patryska that uh, Martin brought up this morning, if the concept of human rights has no experiential basis, no moral basis whatsoever in somehow a view of what it means to resist evil, for instance, uh, then it seems to be uh, just uh, some sort of a compromise. And it, it is more than that. It is about the, the sovereignty of moral sentiment. And I think that... The, the interesting observation is for our Europe of today, the following. As Martin knows, my brother is a diplomat, and he travels around to all these European meetings, and unfortunately we Norwegians are not members of the EU. I'm sorry about that. He's, but, number, uh, he's number two at the foreign ministry right now. You no, know, yes, he's uh, number two in the foreign ministry, so he, he travels around a lot. And he uh, and, uh, has a lot of sympathy for the whole European project, and of course we Norwegians are deeply integrated into it through the EEA. But one thing he worries about a lot of these meetings are all the words where you keep speaking in these large philosophical tones for hours and hours. <laughs> and the question he asks himself is one that is very close to the one that Martin asked this morning. Is this related to the experience of human beings in Europe today? And then we cannot just ask about the primordial experience of being, but also the everyday experience of human beings. And if a political discourse or a legal discourse develops in which people do not recognize the sort of challenges that they have from day to day, for instance, in a modern Europe of, of financial crisis, uh, then I think we have a real challenge to capture and work, and that's a job for lawyers and philosophers, a language of human rights and human dignity in which people find themselves and, and recognize themselves and see that this is my experience that is being now addressed. Uh, I think that's, and that's a moral challenge. Yeah. 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 Okay, last word. Okay, yeah, oh, everybody's yeah. hungry. Oh, and, uh, well, you should have a lawyer talking after lunch. But, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, so very briefly, um, uh, first, um, um, and maybe I can link it because um, I'm not a Dawkinian scholar, uh, but I like what I like about Dawkin is exactly his early theory of taking rights seriously. We have to take rights seriously. Uh, and uh, then comes Law's Empire. And that, that idiosyncratic notion of the moral community from which we get the right interpretation, and especially Hercules, the judge, gets the right interpretation of what rights are, comes to be a bit uh, problematic. Mm -hmm. However, and it's, it, it may respond to um, uh, Maniok's question, whether we have these objective standards. Well, um, I fully agree with... Um, the critique of objectivism, which uh, phenomenology and uh, I know I'm, I'm carefully uh, observed here, but uh, that uh, whatever you say about phenomenology and uh, uh, yeah, you may be scared, but, uh, uh, but uh, I don't believe in objectivism. I believe in interpretation, and law as an interpretive enterprise is something which I believe, and not just as a legal technical project, but as a moral project. Yeah, it has certain moral value, and this leads me to the, the second uh, <coughs> big theme in your question. Yes, we talk, we talk big, uh, uh, what about um, action on ground? And yesterday, or rather today, I, because I arrived uh, yesterday uh, late evening, Yet I uh, managed to meet a um, good friend of mine, former diplomat, and uh, we were sitting and talking until one o'clock in the morning and discussing exactly this. Yeah. What is the impact on lives of ordinary Europeans, of what's going on? Euro crisis, but also uh, the current state of the Union, which is um, if, you, if you have too much law and governance and too little politics, then, of course, you're ruining the project. 
and uh, uh, with uh, so with the rights, I think it's it's a uh, it's interpretive uh, uh, unknown whether uh, uh, the European Union accessed uh, to the European Convention of Human Rights. It will be an I have to stop. No, 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 no. Uh, and uh, but. Uh, the problem, uh, it's, it's a technicality, and we lawyers, we can manage it. Uh, we can manage it. Um, uh, judges uh, of national court, constitutional courts will be talking to the judges in Luxembourg. They will have meetings, conferences, great food in Brussels, and uh, they will sort it out. But the problem is, as long as Europeans will take their rights as only common benefits, rather than commitments and traps, you always will be, uh, you always will be facing potential not, uh, crisis of trust. Yeah? And, and clearly European Union is in crisis. Norway is in crisis with it, despite uh, this Scandinavian Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> no, it's a great I have, I have a very strong passion uh, for Norway, and I knew I could I could tease you with this because uh, 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 I love uh, um, you know, such a such a small country coming from extreme poverty, yeah, into extreme wealth and handling it uh, very reasonably and at the same time uh, so heavily integrated in Europe, much more than many member states of the European Union. Yeah. Norway has a huge commitment, huge res its sovereign state has a huge responsibility um, uh, for European projects so that we can even afford the Nobel Prize. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, so this is, this is one example how you have to commit it. But it's not just for ordinary citizens. Yeah. It's also for political elites and it's for professionals. This is, these are three layers. Political elites, professionals, and ordinary citizens <coughs> have to not create like in political project, but have to have mutual understanding. <laughs> Look, you know, but I still have to follow up what uh, Henrik said. The first, let's uh, get Aristotle into this. First sentence of Nicomachean ethics. Every human uh, endeavor, every human action aims at some good. Uh, even good is what uh, 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 it aims at. We don't know what the good is, but a good. Uh, 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 is what we are aiming. So I think that we should not, or we cannot get rid of the question of good so easily as you try to convince us. And, and the last thing I would like to uh, remind you is Havel's uh, hope that we can discuss international human rights, that that is something like general human experience of the absolute. Uh, I am not uh, telling that anyone is hope of this uh, global church knowing what the absolute is. But we uh, can easily agree that we have uh, uh, some common experience in that, you know, feeling something, having uh, relation to it. And this is the basis for our search, not just of dialogue, but not uh, for a solution. Is it right? Uh, I was being deliberately provocative in separating uh, uh, right and good uh, because it's a great conceptual tool. And uh, I uh, obviously, and I didn't want bring in uh, um, uh, sociology or social theory of systems and different systems communicating in different ways. But yes, I believe that uh, uh, there is a problem with every notion of good or morality because there's, at the same time there is too much and too little morality. Yeah? That's, uh, we, we, everything is moralized and at the same time we feel that nothing gets moralized. We get moral panics. Stranger danger, yeah, and and so on and so on. Uh, this is this only shows one. Um, speaking now as a sociologist of law, law, morality doesn't have integrative function in modern society anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't agree on what is moral uh, and can. Um, uh, however, however, if you give up any notion of morality you realize that you lose even the functionality of a legal system. Mm -hmm. If you say that um, um, if you say that the law is amoral, 
What is the problem of why are we so bothered with the problem of legitimacy? Still so much to do. So I believe in morality as an irritant. Okay. Uh, I just want to say that Martin's defense of the notion of an absolute, quoting Abba, and uh, and also his reference to Aristotle's reference to our everyone's desire for the good. Um, can be uh, integrated into what you're saying, and also a response to some degree to what uh, I don't know. Uh, by remembering that for Aristotle, this is also true for Plato, no doubt true for Hobbes, ideas of the good or the absolute were real, but heuristically approached. Real, but not grasped as objects that were known, real but moved towards through open-ended questioning. So if one, this, in this way you, you, you find a middle ground between objectivism, on the one hand, and some kind of dismissive relativism, on the other, that is extremely important. And this is an advertisement for, or a warning about my talk after lunch. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I think you uh, said the last word, uh, well, it's not that boring. Uh, <laughs> No, 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 I shouldn't have the last word. <laughs> this is my moral contribution. <laughs>